The profound experience of standing at the foot of Jabal Makla resonated with the biblical narrative, where Moses led the people to meet God amidst thunder, lightning, and divine revelations. Joel Richardson's profound understanding of Saudi Arabia's biblical relevance and its archaeological treasures brought fresh perspectives to light when he took 11 of our interested expeditioners on a special visit to a site he had previously discovered. It is located on the side of Jabal Makla within reach of average hikers. The Saudi Arabia expedition offered a gateway to a deeper insight into the Amalekites, unveiling a piece of biblical history that has remained elusive yet intact through the sands of time. Richardson captured images that may cast a new light on ancient scriptural texts. He had previously taken the photos with a camera with a specialized filter so that some of the imagery was focused. The focused imagery revealed not just the artistry of a bygone era, but also whispered tales of giants, adding a new layer of intrigue to the rich tapestry of the region's biblical narrative. Dive deeper into Joel Richardson's insights through his free resources and join us on a teaching expedition to learn for yourself what has remained intact for our lifetime. Joel's teaching and fresh insight into Saudi Arabia's biblical importance and its previously hidden archaeology is unmatched. The Origins of Giants The first mention of giants in the Bible is the Nephilim in Genesis 6 1-4. The sons of God were spirit beings that mated with women and produced the Nephilim. The phrase sons of God elsewhere refers to spirit beings angels, Job 1 6, 2 1 1, 38 7, and Genesis 6 1 2 contrasts this group with all of mankind, not some subset such as Cain's line meaning they are non-human. The common view that this was the mixing of the lines of Seth and Cain assumes that everyone in Seth's line was godly and everyone in Cain's line was wicked. This is not something the text ever claims. Furthermore, alternative views, also including the kingly line view, fail to explain how this intermarriage produced mighty, giant warriors. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown, Genesis 6, 4. It is important to note that Genesis 6, 4 never explicitly calls the Nephilim giants. However, the Nephilim have often been considered giants because of the description of the giants in the land as those who come from the Nephilim in Numbers 13, 32, 33. Also, the Septuagint translates both the Hebrew, Nephilim, and Gibberim, mighty men, or men of renown, in Genesis 6, 4, as gigantes, giants. It may be that the Septuagint translated Nephilim as giants because of the account in Numbers 13, though some think Nephilim comes from the Aramaic word Nephila for giant. Whether descendants of the Nephilim were actually in the land of Canaan is uncertain, as the Israelite spies may have been exaggerating their account. However, exaggeration is unlikely because Genesis 6, 4 says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, and the link between the Anakim and Nephilim in Numbers 13 and 33 seems to be an editorial comment, possibly referring back to Numbers 6.4. At minimum, the claim in Numbers 13.33 shows that the Israelites were aware that the Nephilim of old had a reputation of being giants. More on this below. In the context of Genesis 6, God sent the flood to wipe out violent humans, including the Nephilim, seen in the language of all flesh. Genesis 6, 12, 13. God continued the human race through Noah, a new Adam, who was not tainted by Nephilim blood. Noah's direct lineage is given all the way back to Adam, Genesis 5, 1, 32, and he is said to be blameless in his generations, Genesis 6, 9. Possibly referring to his pure line, notice the plural generations. In spite of the flood, giants eventually made a comeback and dwelt in the land of Canaan. If the giants in the land came from the Nephilim, how did this happen when the Nephilim were wiped out in the flood? While some argue that the flood was only local, this would still be an unlikely explanation because the flood was intended to wipe out the Nephilim in Genesis 6. Thus, there are two likely explanations. One, the same event transpired later in history as spirit beings again bred with women and produced more Nephilim. Two, Nephilim genes were passed down through Noah's daughters-in-law. These wives of Ham, Shem, and Japheth were not descended from Noah and thus potentially had Nephilim genes in them. Israel was afraid of the giants in the land of Canaan, and it would have to be a later generation that dealt with the giants under Joshua's leadership. However, Israel still had to deal with a giant while in the, in the wilderness, Og of Bashan. 
As Israel went up the way to Bashan, King Og came out against them for battle. Yahweh gave Og into Israel's hand, and they devoted Og's people to destruction, Haram, leaving no survivors, just as they had done to Sihon, king of the Amorites, Deuteronomy 3, 6. This victory is celebrated in Psalm 135, 11 and 136, 20. We are told that both Og and Sihon were considered Amorite kings, Deuteronomy 3, par 8. Then we read this fascinating verse, for only Og the king of Bashan was left of the remnant of the Repime. Behold, his bed was a bed of iron. Is it not in Rabbah of the Ammonites? Nine cubits was its length and four cubits its breadth, according to the common cubit, Deuteronomy 3.11. Seeing that a cubit was about 18 inches, Og's bed was about 13 feet, six inches long. This suggests he was a giant. On top of this, Og is said to be the last remnant of the Rephaim. Both Joshua 12.4 and 13.12 also say Og was of the remnant of the Rephaim, who were the Rephaim. They were likely the descendants of a giant named Rapha. Rapha is mentioned six times in the Bible, 2 Samuel 21, 16, 18, 20, 22, 1 Chronicles 26, 8. In contrast to the more common plural Rephaim, though some translations like the ESV take this as giants, Rapha is probably a proper name. Deuteronomy 2 provides some interesting information about the Rephaim, it says the Rephaim were as tall as the Anakim, but were mostly wiped out by Yahweh, Deuteronomy 2.21. The Ammonites called the Rephaim by the name Zamzumim, Deuteronomy 2.20. Deuteronomy 2.10.11 says that the Emim were also as tall as the Anakim. But then it says that both the Anakim and Emim are also counted as Rephaim. This is important, as it links the Anakim with the Rephaim. While Og was one of the last of the Rephaim, there were still Rephaim in the land, namely the Anakim and the descendants of Rapha in 2 Samuel 21, 16, 18, 20, 22. The prior information sheds interesting light on Genesis 14, 5, 7, where Chedor Laomer defeated the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shaveh Kiryatheim, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, in addition to defeating Amalekites and Amorites. It seems Chedor Laomer fought three groups of giants, the Rephaim, the Septuagint actually translates Rephaim in Genesis 14.5 as giants. The Zuzim, which is probably the Zamzumim of Deuteronomy 2.20, and the Emim, Deuteronomy 2.10-11. The Amorites may also have been giants. Amos 2.9.10 says, The Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and Og was also an Amorite, Deuteronomy 3.8. What is all the more fascinating is that Abraham then went and defeated Chedor Laomer, the giant killer, in order to rescue his nephew Lot, Genesis 14, 14, and 17. These groups, including the Amalekites, Amorites, and Anakim, Rephaim, were still in the land during the time of Joshua, Numbers 13, 29, 33. Thus, Abraham's victory in Genesis 14 is a foretaste of Joshua's later victories over the giants in the land of Canaan. The Rephaim are also associated in the Old Testament with Sheol, the place of the dead. They are said to be inhabitants of Sheol in the following passages, Isaiah 14, 9, 26, 14, 19, Psalm 88, 10, Job 26, 5 to 6, Proverbs 2, 18, 9, 18, 21, Mach 16. The Hebrew Rephaim is in every one of these passages, yet you would never see this in the English if reading translations like the ESV, NASB, or KJV. Instead, the ESV uses words like shades, dead, and departed. If we leave Rephaim untranslated, this may reveal the role of the dead giants in Sheol, which is distinguished from other dead beings there. The Rephaim are said to rise up to greet the Babylonians when they sink down to Sheol in death, Isaiah 14, 9. The false gods that Israelites at times worshipped are described as dead Rephaim that will not rise, Isaiah 26, 14. The psalmist asks whether the Rephaim will rise up to praise God, Psalm 88, 10, 11, 88 to 3. The other passages highlight the Rephaim as inhabitants of Sheol, Job 26, 5, 6, Proverbs 2, 18, 9, 18, 21, 16. Once Israel entered the land of Canaan under Joshua's leadership, they had to face the Anakim that the spies in Numbers 13 had feared 40 years prior. Joshua had to be strong and courageous, but with Yahweh fighting for them, he was able to drive out the Canaanites, including the giants. Deuteronomy 1 30 31. Joshua and Caleb were the only two of the 12 spies who believed that Yahweh would give them victory over the giants in the land. Numbers 13 30, 
and thus they were the only two allowed to enter the land 40 years later, Numbers 1430. It is therefore fitting that Joshua and Caleb drove out those giants, which they did by faith in Yahweh. And Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the people of Israel. Only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod did some remain. Joshua 11, 21, 22. Joshua cut off the Anakim and devoted, Haram, them to destruction. Joshua 11, 21. Thus carrying out Yahweh's command for Israel to devote the Canaanites to destruction. Deuteronomy 7, 1, 2. This practice is known as the ban, or simply by its Hebrew term, harem, which means to devote something to God. The Israelites were to kill the Canaanites as an offering to Yahweh. Though not the primary point of God's command, the destruction of the Canaanites included the giants who were in the land. Joshua only left the Anakim in three Philistine cities, Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod, Joshua 11.22. Caleb went to Joshua and said that he was as strong at 85 years of age as he was at 45, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Joshua 14, 6, 11. Caleb then asked Joshua for Hebron, the land of the Anakim. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day, for you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Then Joshua blessed him, and he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jeponah, for an inheritance. Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jeponah, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. And the land had rest from war, Joshua 14, 12, 15. Hebron was the land of the three sons of Anak, so Caleb received the land of Hebron and drove out the three sons of Anak, Shishai, and Ahiman, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak. Together, Joshua and Caleb drove out the giants that the ten other spies feared forty years before. As we have seen, Joshua left some Anakim remaining in the Philistine cities of Gath, Gaza, and Ashdod, Joshua 11.22. This is significant for several reasons. First. This means the task that God gave Israel to drive out the Canaanites was not complete, seen more clearly in Judges 1-2. Second, the Philistines, with whom the Anakim remained, became Israel's chief enemy during the time of Samuel. And third, the Philistines' champion in 1 Samuel 17 was from Gath. This puts David's battle with Goliath in proper context. Goliath was from Gath, one of the three Philistine cities where Anakim remained. Goliath also receives the most explicit description of a giant in all of Scripture. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron. 1 Samuel 17, 4, 7. David did not just defeat some random giant that Saul and the Israelites feared. Rather, Goliath was a remnant of the Anakim that Israel was supposed to drive out of the land of Canaan. The Anakim apparently became aligned with Israel's new enemy, the Philistines. In killing Goliath, David was finishing the task of Haram in Deuteronomy 7 that Joshua began to carry out. Moreover, Goliath is called a gibber, a mighty man, in 1 Samuel 17:51 associating him with the Gibberim Nephilim of Genesis 6-4. David, of course, proved to be his own Gibber in defeating Goliath, 1 Samuel 16-18, after the time of David. As far as we know, the Gibber David, Warren Samuel 16-18, and his group of Gibberim, 2 Samuel 23-8, brought an end to the giants, those Gibberim of old, Genesis 6-4. There are no more Nephilim, Anakim, or Rephaim on the earth. The typical sermon on Goliath today encourages Christians to slay the giants in their lives, usually referring to sin and the fears of life. Advocates of redemptive historical preaching often criticize this example of how preachers cover the Goliath story. However, there may be something to considering our own giants to slay, not primarily our individual enemies, but rather those of the church. 
This connection is seen when we understand that the promised land typifies the whole world in which we dwell. Now that King Jesus has come, the whole earth belongs to him. Matthew 28, 18, Romans 4, 13. And just as there were giants in the land of Canaan that needed to be driven out, the earth today is filled with Christ's enemies. The spiritual giants, including unbelief and false teaching, must be driven from the earth so that all will come to saving faith in Christ. However, this is a spiritual war, not one of flesh and blood, Ephesians 6:12. Jesus defeated the serpent on the cross, along with all spiritual forces opposed to God and his people, Colossians 2:15. And in the end, he will have victory, the nations will be converted, and the spiritual giants will be defeated. In the power of Christ, we now drive out his enemies through the faithful preaching and teaching of God's word. It is a hard task we have been given, and just like the Israelites, we must trust the Lord to bring it about.